speak now and I want to just to give you my testimony of uh, besides the wonderful work that she showed us, Alina is an uh, inspiration, a soul. That I was in Brazil, quite and calm and minding about my own business, and then comes Halina back in 2012. Mm -hmm. She visited my brother and discovered that I was there doing some optical tweezers work. And after that, I see myself running all over the world because Alina just introduced me to Kishan and sent me to San Diego, San Francisco. So she is kind of person that you gotta be around her. <laughs> something is going to happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Lance. That was a very kind things you were saying about me. Anyway, so you might remember that I was telling you in the two first lectures about, um, by the way, it won't be two hours, it'll be shorter than two hours, so we will have longer lunch, okay? So just listen to me and ask questions, and then I'll go very fast. Okay, so I was talking about transfer of orbital or spin angular momentum to particles or to structures that we produce. And we were talking about spin or uh, uh, transfer of spin angular momentum, and for that purpose, we, up to now, using circular polarized light, what we did is that we tried to construct particles or entities which were uh, biofringent either heavily biofringent uh, and spherical or elongated and therefore they had um, shaped biofringents. And then we were also saying that we can use orbital angular momentum and transfer orbital angular momentum to, to other than biofringent particles, so not with biofringents. And what I'm, so, so today I would like to talk about optically driven micro machines or, uh, or Again, this is just to say we again transfer uh, angular momentum of light to entities of some sort. And what I'm showing you at this first transparency is a uh, hog uh, constructed in Kishan's lab. Uh, and uh, this was very clever machine. This was constructed, constructed with electron beam lithography. So uh, the technique is, um, has been described by somebody here before, so I won't go into it. But what, what is important in this technique, it's very precise, and uh, you can produce incredibly small objects uh, in different materials. And, and uh, so this is an example of that, and, and uh, Kishan and his group uh, uh, published paper in science, I believe. Science? Nature? Nature. Nature. Uh, on this, uh, uh, on this optically driven micro machines and that production and so on. So uh, there is another group uh, uh, in Hungary, um, led by Paul Omas, who have been doing optically driven micro machines for a very long time. And they, they actually, this is from their website, uh, and um, <clears throat> these are uh, entities which are produced by using two photon photopolymerization process. And I'll tell you more about that process today. Uh, and somebody actually has mentioned, I think, Carl, um, Les has been talking about two photon absorption and three photon and, and so on. So I will touch upon that. And, and so these uh, machines, you can see, these are connected cogs, and um, uh, you, you, you can rotate them. They are not necessarily three dimensionally trapped. Okay? Um, and they are obviously driven all optically. Okay, so I want to produce uh, um, machine elements. I, I want to rotate them. I want to ask a question today whether I can use Gaussian beams instead of using only orbital angular momentum beams. And the other question which I will um, address today is, remember I told you in the second lecture, I think, that measurement of orbital angular momentum is actually quite difficult. Andrew today showed us that you can use the gauss Legay beams of light for sophisticated quantum information purposes where you are looking at the, at the different modes in a very specific way, and uh, that's true, but what we will do is we'll look at this sort of a um, little bit of a um, cheeky way, or cheeky way, of <coughs> measuring orbital angular momentum. And then what we have been doing for quite a while in our labs here at UQ 
is that uh, we wanted to be able to calculate and then build the machines in which optically driven micro machines which are optimized for transfer of either orbital or spin angular momentum. So Timor, who gave you four lectures on the theory of optical tweezers, and I missed two of them, uh, and he's seen can calculate um, specific constructions of the machines in order to transfer uh, the optimal uh, angular momentum amount. So the idea of uh, micro machines is quite old. Here is the picture of lens from Sandia uh, National Labs. Uh, and this, you can see the scale here. So this bar is 10 microns. So these are incredibly sophisticated machines which are built in Sandia. And, and this sort of machines, so slightly bigger ones, are our sensors which are used in everyday life, for example, in our cars and so on. Uh, and uh, these are fantastic, but they are not optically driven. Okay? So these are electrically driven. So you need leads and stuff to get the electricity to them. And so that's not what we want to do. We want to take some sort of optically uh, active material in some form or shape and drive it on the by light. And also what we want to do is to go down in scale. So the machine that I showed you from Kishan's lab was probably about 5 to 10 microns in diameter, and that's what we want to have. We want to have machines which are about 5 to 10 microns. We want them to be really, truly three-dimensional. So not very thin machines. Somebody was showing very thin structures. I think Ivan was showing his um, liquid crystals, which were constructed in different shapes, but they were still rather thin. And we want to be able to go in thickness much further than that. Okay, so these are our machines. Okay, so this process has been described by Lens before, so what I'm looking at is to use two photon photopolymerization process for producing the machines. So the idea is that I have a resin which uh, reacts to ultraviolet light. When it's exposed to ultraviolet light, it will harden. And if it hardens, hardens in three dimensions the way I want it, then all the unhardened bits can be washed out and I'm left with a three-dimensional structure uh, produced to my liking. So the idea is, and th this much better uh, images than those were shown by then, so if we have fluorescence with one photon, you can see this is, this is my objective here, and, and you can see the fluorescence going all the way through the sample here. However, if I use two photon process, then the fluorescence occurs only in one given spot. So if I want to have very precise constructions of my machines, obviously now what I can do is that I can move that spot in controlled way in three dimensions. That spot, of course, has certain size, but I now can move it in three dimensions, driving it by the computer. And if I do it doing two photon photopolymerization, two photon absorption process, then it's very well controlled. If I, would do, if I would do it with one photon, that would be much more difficult. Okay, and the, <clears throat> this is quite old image from uh, Professor Kawaka's uh, lab in Japan. So this whole bull is about, um, I think, 10 microns in size. And you can see this is done with two photon photopolymerization process in, I think it was SUA, somebody mentioned SUA before. And basically what we use here is time sapphire laser at 780 nanometers and two photons uh, absorption process in this resin. And so what we polymerize in very, very tiny spot. Each time we shine the laser, photopolymerization takes place in very tiny spot. And then you can move either your stage or your laser, depending what you are controlling in the best possible way. And then you can construct this three-dimensional structures. Um, <clears throat> And then, of course, if you marry it with SLMs, which a lot of groups are doing, you can produce a hell of a lot of them in one block. We don't do that, but it's doable. So, again, why am I showing this, 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 this image here is that it's just showing the, the precision with which you can construct little bits and pieces of these machines. It's pretty fantastic. So how does the typical setup look like? Um, so apart from having the setup for optical tweezers, what I here I have also is a, 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 a femtosecond laser, a sapphire femtosecond laser pumped by a um, solid state laser. 
Okay, and so I put this laser into my, uh, my, my setup. Uh, it goes through the objective, so this is high numerical aperture again, and then I control it by the computer. I control my stage by the computer. I have pretty precise stage where the smallest step is few nanometers only in X, Y, Z, uh, and I can control it. So what I do is that when I want the laser to polymerize at a place, the gate is open, and then when I move the stage and I don't want photopolymerization to take place, the, gate, the laser is off. Okay, so this is, this is the shutter which I control through the computer. And then we have all our setup that we might need for whatever we want to do with optical tweezers. So that's a new Dimuniac laser, it goes, I can control its intensity by lambda over two plate, I put it to the objective, and then here, all the setup you see here, I already described to you. If I want to measure rotation, I measure it on this uh, photo detector, and if I quite a photo detector, and if I want to measure polarization state, which is needed for the termination of optical torque, I have this to detect this PD1 and PD2. All right, and this. As you are in Australia, I have to show you the photopolymerization process of something rather Australian. And so if the kids are sitting here from, from primary school and we show that, they are very excited to see that the little kangaroo will be built. And so the objective that I had for Theo, which we still haven't quite fulfilled, is to build beautiful three-dimensional kangaroo. This is only two-dimensional kangaroo, unfortunately. We did build, in another set of experiments, we took one of his legs and put it on a, on a, to be able to turn it, but it's still not three-dimensional, okay? So, but it shows you, basically, how precise this process is. So, what one of our students did is uh, he took this sign, you know, when you travel around Australia, one of the signs you see, be careful of kangaroos if you travel along the road. So this is one of those signs, be careful of which was then um, programmed onto our computer. Okay. So, so that's the kangaroo. And the size is about, so this, this bar is here 15 uh, micrometers, and across here it's 21. So maybe next time when I come to talk to you, we'll have three dimensional hopping kangaroo. Okay, so how do we do it? So this describes the process in itself. So, uh, by scanning the sample of a predetermined 3D shape, complex structures can be produced. And so, I will be showing you complex structures produced in that way. So, here is my resin, and it can be SU8 or some other resin. Uh, what in, we haven't been using that much SU8 in our lab, uh, just because the difference in the refractive index between polymerized resin and non-polymerized resin in SU8 is so small that it's very difficult to see the structure whilst you're producing it. And so, uh, and in other resins, when you polymerize the resin, the refractive index grows so much uh, that uh, increases so much that it's easy to see what you are producing. So this is just for comfort, not for any other reasons, but you can use whatever resin you want. Okay, so then when you have done your structure, you can step and make another structure, but if not, if you're satisfied with one, so this pretty slow process, uh, then you can wash the resin out, and then you are left with your polymerized uh, sample of some sort. So this is one example of microfabricated cross. So um, this is a 3D object, and it was sliced into 2D layers, big mats, each layer is uh, then decomposed into pixels. And so this is how the stage is moving and we're building, so we have a stalk. And you might ask why we have a stalk, but I'll come to that later. And then we're building it bit by bit. So we have about uh, 41 layers, <coughs> uh, and, uh, and, and the structure looks quite nice. So a resolution of the two photon photopolymerization we can look at. It's due to the nonlinearity of the process. Resolution beyond the diffraction limit can be achieved. Uh, it is given <coughs> by the smallest polymerized volume, which is called voxel. And here are my voxels. So uh, we basically can see what sort of um, resolution we have. And if we look very carefully at 
that it's not best in the world for resolution of, of in photopolymerization. There is a very large group in Korea where they are achieving single nano uh, nano meters uh, resolution in this photopolymerization process. However, that's done with use of with the use of a lot of chemistry, and they they are able to show much better resolution than what we have. However, for our purposes, it's, it's good enough because we can overlay the voxels and so therefore we can make the structures not perfectly smooth, but smooth enough for what we want to do. Okay, so you can see these layers here. So this is an image taken by a scanning electron microscope. It's not particularly smooth. It doesn't look anything like Kawata's bull did. Uh, but on the other hand, for the purposes that we are using it for, that's good enough. Uh, so those layers is how we produce the structures. And you can see that it's quite long this way, and between the arms it can be anything between 5 to 10 uh, microns. Now, the question can be, why do we have such a long stalk <coughs> structure? And that you have heard from Kishan and from Lenz and from me before, that if you have elongated structure, it always stands up in the laser beam. So if the laser beam is highly focused and the elongated structure looks like this, it will stand in the beam. So in order for it not to wobble in the beam too much and not to stand where the, where the arms of the cross are, we build the stalk. And therefore we force it in certain, like, in certain direction of the beam. So that's the only reason for the stalk. So we can look at the micro machines and the symmetry of them. So if I have a normal cross, I can take my gauss Lagarde -like beam of light, as I was telling you before, and I can drive it by using gauss Lagarde -like beam of light. But if I then produce instead an offset cross or chiral, chiral cross, then the, the, the face mass looks like this, and what the face structure looks like this. And what it tells me is that this can be driven by using a uh, normal Gaussian beam, okay? So because this is like, like building, through, when I'm going through the structure, it's like build, building shape by projects. Okay, so um, I told you before how I produced the um, 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 gauss Lagarde beams of light, and in actual fact, Andrew repeated it today in his lectures. So I take Gaussian beam, I have this perfect mask, which he described, not that perfect, but good enough. Or you can produce it using um, uh, 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 SLMs as well. Uh, and uh, then, this is charge two hologram. So it, when the Gaussian beam is put through the very middle of this uh, uh, hologram, we will get Laguerre Gauss into first and minus first order. We'll get, get Gauss Laguerre zero to B. Okay, so. This is the rotation of symmetric microstructure in gauss Laguerre beam. So what we are trying to show here is not only does it rotate, but it is also three-dimensional to track, so we can lift it and track it three-dimensionally. And we will drive it through this um, 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 partition just to show you, no, we won't, yes, we will. We'll drive it through this partition just to show you that it's three-dimensional to track, okay? And then if I change the sense of the rotation from, go from uh, gauss Lagarde 0, 2 to gauss Lagarde 0, minus 2, then the rotation will be in opposite sense. Uh, okay, and what I also can do, and I showed that to you before, is that I can also take a circularly polarized light, uh, make the gauss Lagarde beam to be circularly polarized, linearly polarized, and then circularly polarized in opposite sense. So that would mean then that uh, if I have gauss Lagarde zero two beam, I told you that it carries two h bar per photon of orbital angular momentum. If I on top of it make it circularly polarized, then I either add one h bar to it or subtract one h bar from it. And, and then I can put it onto my structure. So what I want to show you now is that as we discussed before, um, um, measurement of orbital angular momentum directly is not difficult in macroscopic 
uh, experiments, but in microscopic experiments, when you send the light through highly uh, high numerical aperture objective, uh, then to determine which part is spin and which part is orbital is very difficult, and then by putting it only onto the hologram, it's very difficult to determine precisely orbital angular momentum. So, we have done it, and Andrew has done it much better in his setups, although they are not microscopic. But uh, on the other hand, in, in, when we did this method in, uh, in, in when the light was going through high numerical aperture objective, uh, the, the uh, accuracy of the measurements was rather poor. Anyway, so therefore we tried to cheat the system and measure the orbital angular momentum in a slightly different way. Remember, the only thing to remember now is that measurement of spin angular momentum is very easy. Right? Because what I have to do if I want to measure spin angular momentum, I just have to collect all the light which is transmitted through the sample and look at the change in the polarization step. Okay? So, so what we do here, we have steady rotation of some microscopic structure and the total torque will be equal to drag torque due to the rotation in the liquid. If we assume that we are dealing with Newtonian liquid, uh, then rotation rate is very easy to determine. And the total torque will be a sum of the spin torque and of the orbital torque. And of course, this total torque I can easily measure. There will be some constant time the, times the rotation rate. And you remember I had a, uh, a one of the, my, my photodetectors was allowing me to measure rotation rate directly. So this omega is easily uh, measurable. So now I can determine the orbital angular momentum and this constant by measuring the spin angular momentum here, the spin angular momentum, and omega for three different degrees of polarization. Left-handed circularly polarized, right-handed circularly polarized, and linearly polarized now. Okay. So if I do that, so these are the three measurements which I made, and if I fit the curve, if I fit the data to a linear function, uh, we can then find orbital torque per photon, which is delta sigma zero, from the slope of the fit. And then alpha and the intercept with the y-axis, omega zero, uh, is then being delta sigma zero is omega over alpha. And so we find that delta sigma um, uh, orbital is 0.2 plus minus 0.03 h bar per photon. So orbital uh, torque efficiency is rather high, it's 10 percent. So it's similar to the spin torque. Uh, we can see that the total orbital torque is simply delta sigma uh, times the power of incoming light divided by frequency of the light. So the orbital torque is 10 times, if you remember my numbers from the previous lecture, the orbital torque is about 10 times higher than the spin component. Um, and if we want to transfer a lot of uh, uh, torque, then it's good to use orbital torque. <coughs> and then we can look at the total torque as well. Okay, um, then what we also have done is to see whether the, the results that we are getting from our experiments agree with uh, theory, so we do hydrodynamic modeling, and this I take this cross, uh, and then I do uh, the um, uh, PDE solution, and we can look at the flow field and shear stress field around the crosses, uh, this cross, and then determine the orbital torque. And the orbital torques, as determined from those calculations, is 0.2 h bar per photon. So orbital torque efficiency is 10% and it agrees very well with what we have measured. Okay, so that was so so that was supposed to how much time do I have from the first part of it before I put them to sleep altogether? Twenty minutes, okay. Okay. So um, the other thing which we uh, try to do is the following. Imagine that you now want to use the rotation, uh, put it in a lab uh, with to, for people who um, don't 
necessar not necessarily are interested in, in for every experiment to uh, which they want to rotate in, in which they want to rotate something to have to put this uh, holographic planes into the setup. Uh, uh, they, they want slightly more compact system to be built. So imagine then that you can, in one process, build the holographic plate which will trans, tr tr uh, change the Gaussian beam into gauss laguerre beam and then underneath of that there is a, a, a rotating element. And so that you do that in your sort of surroundings of your of your, of your uh, commercial microscope, there are no extra elements which have to be allowed. So what we decided to do is to produce a diffractive optical element which will be microscopic diffractive element. So the idea was, as I said, have Gaussian beam coming in through your high numerical aperture objective and then build in the resin, build a diffractive element which will then May transfer, transform my Gaussian beam to gauss laguerre beam of light of some sort and then trap something in that beam and rotate it and then measure viscosity of the liquid in which I'm rotating. Uh, so again, what do I do? I take my femtosecond laser, I put it into the, um, through the high vertical aperture objective and uh, I, the, the laser I use is a Thai sub, not very high powers, and for trapping I still <coughs> use new diminuyak laser. So this time what we produce is a, is a face plate. So now what I have to produce is microscopic face plate. Okay. So in order to produce microscopic face plate, I really have to program the computer which is letting me have the beam on and off in such a way that I can, in layers, produce this, this type of structure. And so I have to be careful how high the structure is so that I get a phase shift which I want to have. And I also have to uh, uh, determine what sort of, uh, how many um, pebbles here I have to have for what, uh, depending on what sort of uh, gauss laguerre beam I want to produce. So then, once we produce that, then that structure is sitting on my microscope slide, and then I come with optical tweezers and I do my trapping. Okay, so this is the structure. So this is layer by layer of the structure which we wanted to produce. And this is uh, the, the um, um, image of it. Um, and so um, this is done by, as I said, two photon photopolymerization, and of course, in optical microscope, this image looks like this. So this has um, eight um, arms because we want to produce gas laguerre zero four. And this is the real structure. You can see that it's not as beautiful as the model of it, but it works. So this is scanning electron micrograph of that structure. Okay. So again, so idea here come in with Gaussian beam, put it on the face hologram, whatever the hologram happens to be, then I change it to gauss laguerre beam of light. This is actually not LG04, but this is LG01, but never mind, I've showed you LG04 before, and it will be a donut beam. Okay? And now that donut beam carries all to angular momentum, and then I can rotate structures, which will be underneath of it. So what do I do? I take my... Uh, cross, and then I, I produce the cross and I produce the structure, I knock the cross off, I put it underneath of the, of the hologram, and it should rotate. Okay, so this is how it will look like, and this is what we did. So this is my cross here. You cannot see it very well because it's not exactly in the proper spot of the light at the moment. And this is my uh, hologram. And now what I will do is I will move, I will trap this particle and then I will move the hologram over the particle and see whether it will rotate. So why bother? Because it's very good for lab on the chip. Have we done it? No. Other people have done a little bit more. Okay, so 
This is how, uh, no, let, let us see, that's not what I wanted. I don't know why it's there. Fabrication process. This is on offset process, but never mind. So we actually are producing one by one. So it's, each process takes about 15 minutes, each cross test takes about 15 minutes, so if you're in a hurry, you can't do it. But as we heard from many talks here, if we put um, uh, SLM and play with the algorithm, uh, we can produce uh, uh, spots of light in many places at the same time. Uh, if we use uh, a lot of correction that will have intensity in each of those spots, exactly the same, we'll be producing the same sort of shapes at every spot. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's all doable. Um, I don't quite understand what happened. I have to go out and see what happened to my rotating structure. Probably didn't rotate or something. Let me see. Okay. Here it is. Okay, so I'm driving a Honda and it starts rotating. And you can rotate it quite fast by getting more power into the uh, element, rotating element, uh, the refractive element is trapped. And now we let it go. We're just showing that this is a cross. So normally, in Gaussian wave, of course, it won't rotate. But if you if you put it into the Gauss Lagrange, you're not likely to rotate. Okay. Now, is it perfect Gauss Lagrange zero four? Probably not, because what happens with uh, first of all, the structure is not a perfect structure. Secondly, we are using it in highly focused situation. So what the structure really looks like in the very focused spot of the light when it's trapping something, I'm not quite sure. Mm. Okay, so as I said, what can, what can we use it for? We can use it for producing flows. So if I want to uh, sort, for example, uh, red blood cells, uh, then I can, uh, I can uh, put them through this rotating machine, and then when I want to turn it off, I turn it off. Uh, when I want to turn it on, I turn it on, and, and that can all be done on the lab on the chip. Okay, so now we can also use offset crosses, and the, again, idea here is that if I have offset cross, I don't need any, uh, in order to uh, transfer all triangular momentum, I can use uh, Gaussian beam to start with. So I don't need any diffractive elements. Neither macroscopic nor microscopic refractive elements. So, so this is my uh, model for the cross. This is how we produce it. So this is um, um, uh, the scanning electron microscope uh, uh, photo of the cross which we produce. Again, it has quite long stalk, and the stalk is there for the for, for trapping it in a right uh, orientation. So we do that. And this is how it's produced. So again, uh, each pixel is 100 by 100 nanometers, and um, uh, we, there is the stalk, and there is the rest of the structure. And as I, I showed you that already, so this is the fabrication process. Um, and you can see how it starts. So we start with the stalk, then we start building the arms, being built, and you can see the whole structure is built layer by layer. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we jump to the next spot and build the structure. Okay, so here's the structure. And as I said, we want to uh, set it um, standing up in the beam. And here's the rotation of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I repeat again, this is Gaussian beam coming through the high numerical objective aperture, and you can see that we can rotate it pretty fast. And then we will change the uh, polarization uh, of the beam when it goes down. Okay? So this is 
So it's three-dimensionally trapped and can rotate very quickly, uh, very fast. And again, we do the simulation of the drag top, and again, we do, uh, uh, so this is our model, and we look at fluid velocities close to the rotor, and we look at the shear stress as before, and we compare it with our experiments, and it looks pretty good. So the last thing I want to tell you uh, before we break is um, the, the, the question is whether we can be, whether we are able to transfer optimal amount of auto angular momentum to our structures, and if so, how should our structures look like, what those structures should be. So, so this is the these, this picture is showing the structures that are, have been trapping up to now. Either normal cross or offset cross, either with Gauss air beams of light or with uh, um, uh, Gaussian beams. And I always had this stalk because I wanted the structure to stand up in the beam. But what if you produce something like this? Uh, this is not working yet. Uh, instead of having a, a stalk, I now have a hole in the middle of the structure. And, um, and material ring, which will be built, matches the focal ring for the stability. So Norman gave it the name optical aerobic. Uh, there, is, there is a game with triangular aerobic. So this is just a tiny one of those. And the, the ambition here was to get high torque efficiency. So again, I will now try to match that structure to be exactly the same size, the ring to be the same size as my Gauss-Lagare beam of light, and then give me enough change in the face so I have to corrugate it somehow around the ring so that uh, I can transfer all the one. So this is my structure. So this is the corrugated structure. And so we are showing here that we can change the structure depending on what sort of uh, gauss Lagarde beams of light we'll be using. So I told you a long time ago that as you go up in the charge of gauss Lagarde beam, the, 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 the black hole is getting bigger and the little ring of, of um, intensity of, intense beam of light is getting narrower. So depending on what we are using, we'll then try to uh, construct uh, structures so that they match the beam. Okay, so this is one uh, calculated structure. This is its uh, standard electron micrograph. Okay, and that's our beam here. Okay, and so again, this is standard electron micrograph, and here it's in an optical microscope, of course, and it's being trapped. And it's rotating. Okay. No? That was the shortest film ever. So it's going round and round. And you can see we, we are showing here the different. Uh, we thread and grab here a few images, and you can see how it sort of speeds up and starts rotating. It looks pretty good. I think we take a little break now. I don't have much to tell you, so I'll just continue for a few minutes after the break. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, I have a question. When you talk about uh, not using Gaussian light here, using uh, the Gaussian beam, you're not uh, uh, having this kind of rotational angle, uh, I mean, this kind of angle momentum. I was thinking um, that uh, is this is similar to some sort of a micro, uh, if you can think of a micro, aerodynamics that you make a fan shape, then you have a wing, that, that wing doesn't have the uh, angular, but it still can cause rotation uh, if you make a, a shape like a blade for, for the, mm. the fan. So like a fan, actually. Yeah. Yeah. No, here we actually do create the structure, which when it's illuminated with the Gaussian beam, it has, you could say that it has shape by fringes, and that's what gives it rotation. Yeah, but I, what I'm saying is that you 
could think of making fan shades using the micro aerodynamics to create the rotational work, which is not probably not the same as what you the shape that you put it in with that recoil force on the cross on the mm, asymmetric shape. But uh, yeah, that's basically what I think. which I showed you here, where was this? I showed you this one, where was the path? This one is where this effect takes. So this is scattering force. And if I'm moving it up and down on either side of the focus, they can make it actually go the other way. Down. That's, I think, a little bit closer. Purely scattering. But chirality is, yeah, I, is different. The thing is that there will be no difference here if he would be using, if in this experiment different polarizations of light would be used, nothing will change. So that's not transfer of momentum. Uh, well, it is transfer of momentum, but not uh, optical, orbital momentum. Okay? Yeah? What intensity of light do you use for the polarization? It's actually not very much. I think that, well, we did some studies, but I think it's something like, um, so these are femtosecond pulses. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head what it is, but it, when it's rather small. There is an optimum of what you should use. You know, if you go too high, it's not good, and if you go too low, it's not good either. It's actually better if it's too low. Huh? It's better yeah. that it's too low, then you just stay low. You mentioned the air bubbles, the gas bubbles, the power too high, and I think it goes down to, we make it about 9 or what pulses that in the sample. It's about 18 or 40 years. So there is the, the throughput, of the microscope, normal microscope, if you don't buy a super little microscope, is about 50%. So what Alex is saying is it's, if it's 18 or 20 milliwatt. From, from the laser. Then. From the laser okay. in, then it means that in the bottom spot we have only, at the best, half of it. At the best. The microscopes are really, I mean, people do have microscopes for infrared or okay. radiation, you can buy them. But we which is that one with more power and then they go in. Yeah? Have some more coffee. 